and welcome to another episode of Pokemath. My name is Stefan Eriksson, and here in episode number 54, we're going to be taking a look at the Hisuian Heavy Ball. And more specifically, how often do you succeed in finding a basic Pokemon when you use it? But before we get into the itty gritty math details, let's take a more detailed look at what the card actually does for you. So, first of all, it lets you look at your face down prize cards and enables you to fetch a basic Pokemon from there and you can then replace it with the Hisuian Heavy Ball. If you don't find any basics, you simply just discard the, he the Heavy Ball, just like any other item. And what does it do for you in your deck? Well, besides granting your consistency boost, boost in fetching out your basics, it overall gets a better chance for getting tech cards in there and or control options. Why do I write control? Well, I, get, I take any excuse to write any control options there, but what I mean with this, playing one-offs becomes a lot easier, provided the one-offs are basic Pokemon, for instance. But it's typically a problem we've seen in the past when you play control, so now it's very welcome to have such a card in the format. But control aside, we've also seen this been used in many other decks out there, like the Gigas deck, or the Richie deck, or the new, Faye, new uh, Dialga V-Star, Yes, V-Star deck that has now won a couple events out there. So it's quite nice. And you can use it basically in so, so many decks that hopefully will grant you a nice consistency boost and just some nice options out there. But overall, you want to ask yourself, or some may already ask themselves, how often do I succeed slash fail when using this card? And that is what hopefully I'll help you answer at the end of this episode or during this episode. But before we get into the itty gritty math again, I would like to give a huge shout out to Simon Oebo who has helped solving all this math here and helped putting up this nice equation we can hopefully use. So, what do we need to know in order to calculate this? So, before you get too confused just like Slowpoke, let's look at it step by step. So first you need the probability of having X number of basics in your starting hand of the game. Second, you need the probability of pricing at least one basic Pokemon. This of course has something to do with when the card would actually work because you need to have at least one basic out there otherwise the card just won't do anything and you simply just discard it. Finally we need to correct for the chance of having a mulligan or the probability of having a mulligan. All these individual components we actually discussed them in previous episodes of Pokemath so you can go and watch episode for instance one and three this will be used some of these items but let's go into how we would do it in this case and let's do it via an example shall we. So, for instance, assume you're playing 10 basic Pokemons in a deck, then we can do the following. What is the approach? Well, first we calculate the probability of each different scenario. And once we have all these scenarios, we can sum them up and correct for mulligans. But you may want to think, hmm, what do I mean by each of these scenarios, perhaps? Well, what I mean by that is, for instance, you have in the first scenario, you have one basic Pokemon in your starting hand, and then at least one in your prices. The second scenario would be two basics in your starting hand and at least one in your prices, up until and including seven basic Pokemon in your starting hand and at least one in your prices. You have to think about it as such that for each extra basic Pokemon we have in our starting hand, well, of course, there's a less of a chance there for there to be a basic Pokemon out in your prices, right? So that's why we have to account for all these different scenarios. And of course, we can just add up the probability that we get for each of these scenarios, and then we correct it for mulligan, and that's it. So let's try and do that one by one, shall we? So first, we can use the hypergeometric distribution to solve this, and you've seen in many of the episodes, I really like to use this distribution, and this is no different. So in the first scenario, we got these two components, as you see here. First of all, on the left, you can see that we have the probability of starting with one basic Pokemon in hand. If you want the more detailed argu argument or explanation for how this works, please just go and visit episode 1 again. It'll be very nice. And oh, before I get any further, check this deck you later out there. I'll leave the, uh, the link in the description below. But it can help you also do this by, for yourself. So you can actually try calculating all these things for yourself. It's a really nice tool and I think you should go check it out. So on the left, like I said, the probability is starting with one basic in your hand. On the right side, we see the probability of having at least one basic in your price cards. But if you look a little closer, you may notice something a little off here. I say one minus something. Hmm. That is because, as also Simon argued here uh, when he told me this, oh, great, we actually have to look at the probability of not having in your price cards. And we just take the reverse of that, which is hence the one minus. So you also see how this uh, whole equation is built up. 
and that's essentially what we're actually doing. If you're solving this here, you get the probability of 2849. We write it here in decimal numbers to four decimals, but you should imagine there's actually way more, but we just leave it at four decimals for now. So with no correction for mulligans, the probability of this happening over here is 28.49%. Okay, that's pretty good, but that only solves scenario number one. So that's what we had here, right? Showing it here again on my left. And for the second scenario here, we get now only 15.93%. And of course it should be lower because now for each additional Pokemon we have in our opening hand, there's of course less chance for us to have at least one over our prize cards. Hence why the probability will decrease as we go along. For free, we go to 4.24. We go down to only, well, 0 0.6 if we round, but 0 0.57 and it continues downwards all the way down to scenario number seven. And actually it's practically zero. It doesn't mean it's exactly zero, so let's go and fix that really quick here, shall we? Add some more decimals. This is just to show in practice is a very low probability, but it's non-zero, of course. And of course, when we calculate this, we want to be precise. Hence, we are gonna, you know, use all decimals possible here. So that's why I also just showed it here for you guys here, just to extend it. But usually we just keep it at four decimals. We sum it all up. And it gives roughly 49.26%. But wait, this is not corrected for mulligans, so let's go ahead and do that, shall we? You see it up here, and if you want a more detailed explanation again, go back and see episode 1 or 2, for instance. But correcting for this, that means we are dividing with 1 minus the probability of having a mulligan, then we land at, well, roughly 2 thirds, 66.45% to be precise. And of course, why don't we want to use mulligans? Because those are hands we don't really care about. Because we cannot start the game with no basic in our hand. Hence why we're basically resetting every time. That's why we have to correct for this. And this gives us, yeah, like I said, 66.45%. So roughly two thirds. Not bad. And this is for the case of 10 basics. You may want to think, how can we generalize this? Because this was just for 10 basics and it looks like a lot of steps to calculate. Well, if we define the following three things. First, AN which means drawing exactly n basics in our starting hand, bn, which is that we price none of our basics of our remaining 53 cards. Why 53? Because we already drew the first seven in our starting hand, right? So we only have the remaining 53 to place prices from. And finally, m for having a mulligan. Putting all this together, we can write up the following here. This looks a little complicated. Don't worry about it. It basically sums up all the probabilities here. That's why n, is the amount of basics in our starting hand, and we have to sum each of the different scenarios. So if you think about it a little bit, if you just think about it for the case of 10 basics we just worked through, then you can hopefully see what we exactly did here. And we can also spread out a little bit. Don't be scared by this big monstrosity of a formula. You can think about it again for the case of 10 basics, just insert the numbers that we have, and it'll basically solve itself. You just, of course, have to do it for each of the different seven scenarios, right? and then correct for the mulligans. That's exactly how you can do it. But we've also done your huge favor here. You don't really have to do this all by yourself if you don't want to. We also just compiled a nice table showing for at least a case from one up until 30 basics in your deck. We could have gotten more than 30 basics, but then we're getting into the land of, this is not really happening, is it now? Or correct me if I'm wrong, if you have a, a decent deck out there with more than 30 basics, then we maybe should go and calculate that as well. As you see here, we start all the way from one basic in your deck, and there the probability of success is zero, which makes perfect sense. Why? Because if you only have one basic in your deck, you have to start with, which means there could be none in your prize cards. Hmm, makes sense. And then it simply just moves up and up and up, of course. It's a decreasing function in this case. It just goes upwards. And I encircled here the case of 10 basics like we worked in our example, giving roughly two thirds. So hopefully this table here can be of use to you guys. So you can just refer back to this table when you want to know, based on how many basics you play in your deck, how often do I succeed in playing the Hesudian Heavy Ball. And with that said, that is exactly what we learned today. So recapping, we learned exactly how often you succeed on playing the Hesudian Heavy Ball. And again, a big thanks to Simon Urpel for helping out with this one here. And for the rest of you guys, I hope you enjoyed this class at Stephen Classroom, and I hope to see you back for another one in the future. Have a great day. Thank you.